Mulberry Street, New York, in June of 1971. The residents of Little Italy prepared to go uptown to Columbus Circle to celebrate Italian-American Unity Day. The rally had been organized by Joe Colombo, the leader of the Italian-American Civil Rights League. The purpose was to protest against discrimination and to demonstrate that the Italian community was united. At 10.05 in the morning, Joe Colombo became number one. Colombo had been wounded by a certain Jerome Johnson, who almost immediately afterward became number two. Oh, come on, give the guy a For a while, number three didn't appear. Excuse me, were you here when Mr. Colombo was shot? I uh, no. Were you here? Yeah, I was here. Can you describe what happened? I don't know anything. How do you feel about it? You can't print it. That's it. In the lower right, you'll find one Pete the Snake, Candarini. 22 arrests and at least eight convictions. The FBI knows him by this number. He's currently under federal indictment for gambling. How do you feel about it? I feel fine. How do you feel? We're holding it with my hands. <laughs> How do you feel about it? I don't even know anything happened, to tell you the truth. I'm back here stopping people from coming in. Do you think this will have any effect on the Italian Unity Day? No, the Italians always stick together. That's for sure. That's all I have to say. Read about it in the paper. This man doesn't carry a number on his back, but he has one. That's Frank Hotz de Sapio. He's been convicted for burglary, assault, and robbery. 22 arrests, and the New York police used this number to describe him. There were a lot of people in this crowd with no police record. Honest, indignant, and furious Italians with some honest ethnic arguments. Well, listen, you people, you people have always stunk. The, not you as individuals, okay? But the people you work for, the people that are in control of your newspapers, the people that are in control of your television stations, you all stunk. You stink for working for them because they've been guilty of their racist attitudes, not only to people of different colors, but to people of different national origins. The, I don't know what, what, what particular uh, company do you work for? What WCBS. WCBS, that's Bill Paley, okay? Bill Paley and CBS, if you get your done a Bradstreet sheets and you look down a run of, of, of conglomerate subsidiaries that they own, they're in control of newspapers, book publishing firms, radio stations, television stations throughout the entire country, the way NBC is, the way RCA is, okay, with Dave Sarnoff. And the people you work for are responsible for every single thing that's happened in this country in terms of racist attitudes, in terms of suppressing and oppression of poor people and grassroots people that, were, that always had needs. How do you feel about the fact that Mr. Colombo was shot here today at your Unity Day? How do I feel about that fact? That's something that I, as an Italian, based on my own cultural lifestyle, which you know absolutely nothing about, will have to deal with personally. Well, you may speak Italian. I've lived in Italy. You may have lived in Italy. But unless you're an Italian, then you lack the capacity to be able to feel the way another Italian feels. We're part of the plan with me for Joey. In unity, we pray to our Father that Joey Colombo makes it. Our Father... A little later, Nick Pileggi will tell you why Joe Colombo was shot. But nobody knows who killed the black man who shot Colombo. Give us a stay, our daily bread. In the next 10 months, there were 14 shootings, which may have been connected to the events of the state. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. For example, 
one Frank Ferriano, a school janitor who owned a big blue Cadillac and who was shot to death in a parking lot near the Holland Tunnel. For example, one Dominic Big Dom De Angelis, a reputed Colombo gambler, was found dead on a Brooklyn corner with $500 in his pocket. The word was that one Joe Gallo had engineered the shooting of Joe Colombo. Gallo married his second wife in a quiet civil ceremony in March. Twenty-three days later, he was dead. Crazy Joe never finished the biography he had started. Whatever he knew, he took with him. So here we are, back with the Civil Rights League. And number 14 is up there on the platform, not knowing he has a little less than 10 months to live. Was he with Gallo, Colombo, or crossing both of them? Right up there with the big guys, right up there with the Pezzi da Novanta is one Gennaro Ciprio, who'll be killed with over a thousand dollars in pocket money on his body. My name is Luigi Barzini, and I know I have no number. This is Nicholas Pileggi, and the number he has is 16. 16 years with the Associated Press and now with New York Magazine as one of America's leading reporters on crime, the mafia, and the Italian-American community. Luigi Barzini is an Italian-Italian, was educated in New York, where he worked as a cub reporter. He's the author of several best-selling books, including From Caesar to the Mafia, and for years he's been a member of the Italian Parliament's permanent committee on the mafia. What's surrounding us here is about 10 miles of films which CBS Nick and I have accumulated in a year of research on Italian-Americans and more particularly on the Mafia. And what we propose to do is to dip in and out of this footage like journalists writing up their notes. Here with an essay on the Mafia. Sweetie, oh, wake up, sweetie. It's time for your four o'clock pickle. Oh. Now, come on, now, you know what the doctor said. Yes, uh, bring me a Vlasic kosher dill. Uh, honey, would you mind having a Vlasic no garlic dill? Hmm? But I crave a garlic dill. <laughs> yeah, well, but you, can't you just eat them during the daytime? <laughs> hey, honey, you've really been a brick through this whole thing. Vlasic pickles, or whatever pampering needs to be done. Don't write with a blueberry. With a blueberry, you're gonna get a half a tea, a piece of wine. Besides, it would take you two boxes of blueberries to write one postcard. That's how small they are. If you must write with a fruit, write with a big banana. A smooth, writing, fine line marker beauty. It comes in a lot more colors than a blueberry, and it costs a lot less money than a car. 29 cents. The big banana. Let's pick up our essay on the Mafia. Nicholas Pileggi has been investigating every frame of film made on the day Joe Colombo was shot. Nick, it's your story now. It's still June 28, 1971, and Joe Colombo has just been shot. One of the ideas behind this rally was that there is no Mafia. And by saying the Mafia exists, you somehow defame all Italian Americans. But the shootings of this state and this very footage were the beginnings of the end of that idea. The New York police have identified at least 100 faces in this crowd as belonging to people with criminal records. For example, the speaker finishes. And the face in the cameo is a name in police files. This is Nick Bianco, once arrested for possession of a gun with a silencer. He was on this date reputedly a member of the Colombo family. Since the day of the shooting, some people who want him can't find him. One of the fascinating things about this rally was the intermingling of the many impeccably honest Italians with the few with records. At the podium is Paul O'Dwyer. Of course, he's not Italian. He's an Irish politician. To meet old friends and new friends. Behind him on the left is Mead Esposito, the Brooklyn Democratic County leader. Yet drifting in is Joe Annacci. He's the one with gray hair. He was once on trial with Joe Colombo Jr. 
in a coin melting scheme. He's currently under federal indictment on a bookmaking conspiracy charge. Some people say this is as close to respectability as Joe Iannacci will ever get. At the podium is Maya Kahane. He's not Italian either. He's an activist rabbi. At the lower left enters Frank DiSapio, whose number we saw a few minutes ago. Walking through the crowd is Tony the Gawk Orgello. He'll be arrested one week after this rally by the FBI. They'll find two loaded 38s in his car. This rally was one of two great shocks to the Italian-American community. The second blow began three months before when a film called The Godfather started shooting on the streets of New York. The Italian-American Civil Rights League had put pressure on Paramount Films to delete certain words from the script. In March, Al Ruddy, the producer, and Anthony Colombo, Joe's son, held a press conference and said certain words would not be used. That's Anthony Colombo, but keep an eye on that great big ring in the upper right of your picture. I think because of the concern of Mr. Ruddy and Paramount Pictures, this movie will not use these words, uh, Mafia and Cosa Nostra, which have for so long defamed the Italian-American people. Do you feel at all intimidated by what? By, by uh, this action on the part of the Italian Civil Rights League? Not only am I not intimidated, but they have been very helpful to me in physically setting up certain aspects of this production. The man with the ring is one Joe Butter De Chico, a member of the Colombo family. He's been convicted for robbery, grand larceny, and forgery. When The Godfather opened this year, the shock finally hit the Italian community. The movie at this moment is on its way to becoming perhaps the greatest moneymaker in film history. $100 million is the projected take. Thank you. Nick, since New York is your mafia beat, suppose you tell us what's going on here. Well, obviously a gang war is going on. The mafia is fighting with itself. Americans like to think that the mafia is like an American corporation with a president and vice presidents and stockholders. But it isn't that at all. It's a group of loosely knit families with unwritten treaties between the families. Sometimes the treaties get broken. Joe Colombo violated some of the rules and warfare broke out. A little later in this broadcast, I think we can say exactly why Joe was shot. That's the first thing that's happening. And in a way, it's of the smallest importance. The most important thing is that the Italian American community is in a state of shock. The mafia numbers about 5,000, and the size of the Italian American community numbers between 7 and 25 million, depending upon who's counting. Whichever figures you use, less than 1% of 1% of the Italian American community is in any way connected with crime. But the 99 plus percent feel, and properly so, that the rest of America looks on all of them as somehow stigmatized by the mafia. There isn't any doubt that the media and the FBI, for example, have led to this stereotyping. The Italian-Americans think it's important that the country at large realize the enormous contributions they have made. And they wish America could look at the heroes of this country who were born Italian. It's a long and impressive list. There's something cultural down at the bottom of all this I'd like to talk about. Most Americans forget that a small part of every immigrant group has made the passage from the working class to the middle class by way of crime. Crime and sports and entertainment, but it's crime which interests us here. Crime has been an American way of life for some sections of all immigrant groups. In the 19th century, the control of crime first belonged to the English, then to the Swedes and Germans. In the 20th century, the leading criminals were first Irish, and then Jews. The Italians took control during Prohibition. But right now, organized crime seems to be passing from the Italians to the blacks. After each fraction of an ethnic group goes from crime to respectability, it gets shocked by the criminals of the next group. Unfortunately for the Italians, this period of dominance has emerged with a vast multiplication of mass communications. This mafia group looks much larger than it is. It's my opinion, but it's shared by other journalists and criminologists, that the Italian Mafia is in its last days, that this recent wave of shootings, with a few more to come, is like the last bright blue flame when a light bulb goes out.
The Italian-American community is hypersensitive about the subject, and you can't blame them. They've said there is no mafia, no cosa nostra, when there really is, small as the organization might be. Of course, they never use the word. But let's get into the substance of our broadcast. What we want to show is that the mafia is a corruption of some absolutely wonderful virtues of the southern Italian. The publicity around the mafia is a corruption of the Anglo-Saxons' traditional suspicion of the dark-eyed Mediterranean. America is predominantly a Protestant Anglo-Saxon country which has traditionally a suspicion of the Catholic. Now, the South and Sicily are a magnification of all of Italy's virtues and vices. It is in Sicily that the extreme of clannishness is found. Let me give you an example. One night, a petty hoodlum was killed in a village square. I was there and so was a CBS news crew. The people you see lived on the plaza, knew the man who had been shot and undoubtedly knew who shot him. Yet we with our questions, we with our microphones, we were outsiders somehow connected with authority. The clan closed around itself. They know nothing. They take care of things within their own family. There is a word for this emphatic denial of outside authority. These honorable people use the word mafia to mean an attitude, not an organization. Mafia can mean being proud and secretive in the face of authority. And how did this all come about? Let's go back further in time and look at southern Italy where most Italo-Americans come from. This film wasn't taken in the 1880s, but it could have been. Southern Italy is not only one of the poorest parts of Western Europe, it is the most conquered. At least 22 times, from the Phoenicians to the American army, these people have been overrun by outsiders. They've lived under foreign rule forever. Alien and hostile people have written their laws for them. In order for the peasants to survive, they invented their own and written codes of justice and punishment. Between honorable men, there were spoken and unspoken understandings that had nothing to do with aliens' law. About 1880, a series of natural disasters struck the country. The soaring birth rate made southern Italy the incubator of Europe. Immigration was the only way out. So hundreds of thousands fled, first to South America, and then in extraordinary numbers to the east coast of the United States. Over two million immigrants left Sicily and the South for America. They carried with them two great notions, that only the immediate family could be trusted and that the rest of the world would be hostile. America was hostile. The immigrant experience has been sentimentalized, but it was savage. About one third of the Italian immigrants couldn't stand it and went back. Troops of men would come from a single village brought over by a contractor called the padrone. Many of these padrones were thieves and loan sharks and the men never got out of debt. The word wop probably comes from the corruption of the Spanish word guapo, meaning handsome. But the legend grew that wop means W-O-P, without papers. The Americanization of the Irish had just taken place, and now the Irish were heavily in the immigration service. The tall English-speaking Catholic and the short Italian-speaking Catholic. Religious and cultural tension began right away. These newcomers found a culture far more difficult than the one they had left. Dark, swarthy southern Italians. A few years earlier, in Louisiana and Mississippi, the tall white landowners thought these Sicilians might be a little hardier race of blacks. They imported them for the cotton fields. What the immigrants did was repeat their patterns. A whole Italian village buried itself in a single New York tenement. 
buried itself in the protective vessel of the family and tried to defend itself from American life. There was extortion, there was the black hand, but most of the crime was Italian against Italian. So long as the crimes they committed were against themselves, the police couldn't care less. Five blocks from the city hall, as this film shows, the filth violated every rule of the sanitary code. The greatest chain was the one around their throat. Many were illiterate, even in Italian. They took whatever work could be found. The women labored in the sweatshops and their men helped organize some of the powerful unions that were just beginning. Getting the money to live is what counted most. In those days, the formal education of the children counted little. The good girl went to work or stayed home. The bad girl went to school. The boys learned from the streets, not from school. Most of New York's truancy laws date from the Italian immigration. Children didn't go to school because school meant authority and authority was something to be feared. Wherever America gave the immigrant a fair chance to work, a fair chance to compete, there were no secret societies, no mafia. The railroad would take him out of little Italy. It would take him away from the east where he was hemmed in, oppressed by the immigrants who had just preceded him. The move west would even take him away from the mafia and those are the hidden societies that ruled them with unspoken old country laws. Italo-American Gothic, the year 1905. 125 people from 100 families had died of malaria in the cotton fields of Louisiana. Abandoned by their patrons, the rest were led out by a priest sent by the Vatican, a certain Father Bandini. In Arkansas, they bought land cheaply that the Anglo-Saxons thought couldn't be farmed. But these Italian peasants out-farmed the locals and built a community called Tonti Town. The Southern Protestants were at first hostile to these Dago Catholics, but as the Italian-Americans proved themselves, they became Arkansans. Here they are, free of the hardships of Italy, free of the getters of the East Coast, peaceful in the new land, Americani. Standing in the windswept Ozarks, a little girl, add 65 years to her, and she becomes an American to the ice cream cone. Take another little girl, far from Italy. Add 65 years to her, too. And here is the truest story of the Americanization of the Italian. Flies, roaches, insect men. I come not to praise this food, but to eat it. Sire, a message. Announcing the decline and fall of the bug empire? Who dares threaten the empire? Raid! Raid house and garden bug killer. Hunts bugs down like radar and kills them dead. And indoors, Raid won't stain draperies or furniture. Outdoors, Raid won't harm plants. Get Raid. Anita, how could they make a better fabric softener? You know, I'd like one I could put in first, right at the start of the wash cycle. Announcing Rain Barrel. It works in the wash cycle. No bother with the rinse. Rain Barrel softens in the wash because it works with detergents. Rain Barrel, new from Johnson. Whenever you're driving and wherever you're bound On freeways and byways, the whole country round You'll feel better knowing anytime, anywhere That like a good neighbor, State Farm is Isamu Kaneshigi makes a career out of helping people in Waipahu, Hawaii. 
He's one of more than 10,000 State Farm agents throughout the country who provide personal attention to every family insurance need. He can help you too if you live in Waipahu. If you live somewhere else, just check your local yellow pages. And like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. State Farm is there. Donty Town, Arkansas was of course called Tony Town by its Anglo-Saxon neighbors. The students at university at Fayetteville, nearby, bring their dates to this exotic city for an adventure in Italian cooking called Ville Parmigiana. As the years went by, it became mid-south and sleepy and peaceful. This community of Italians has no sheriff, no crime at all, nobody on any police blotter. It buried itself deeper and deeper into American customs of supermarket and pickup truck. You'd think it was all gone. The Tommaso Segatore had finally become Tom Sawyer, but under this, there is still Italy. The game is called Morra, and it dates back to when the Greeks conquered Sicily. What they are doing is guessing what the total number of extended fingers on the two right hands will add up to. The score is kept in the left hand. It was the only form of gambling for two peasants in a field. And of course it was outlawed by the authorities, and of course it has been played forever. This is the way Southern Italians think learning should be passed on by ear from generation to generation instead of by eye from books. It's homecoming time in Arkansas, the feast of the Assumption, Ferragosto, a great festival. The families come back the way Italian cultural memory always brings the family back. There is no mafia here, no secret society, no crime, just this mixed up, unpredictable weave of American and Italian habits. Now you start to and pass through and swing now. Alum and left, then weave around that ring. The face is out of the hills of Sicily, but that accent, that accent is out of the hills of the Ozarks. Well, who's that a dancing with my corner? Swing in that little old wine maker me. Suckle up! We're praying for rain and tonic. You can play a good game trying to guess which face is Anglo Saxon and which face is Italian. Alaman left, Alaman the right and left, you got that star. Got a broken heart and a woman on my mind. Shoot that star, pull around. To the Anglo Saxons, it looks like an innocent square dance, but in old Sicily, this would have been sinful. In southern Italy, men and women never touched in public, never danced together. A great festival always took place in Italy at the end of summer, and so, responding to their history, these Italian-Americans show their grapes. Alas, Arkansas is a local option state. These big, heavy concords are on their way not to become good Italian wine, but Welch's grape juice, Welch's jellies, jams, and grapes. In wine there is truth, but in grape juice there is heartburn for Italian Italians like Barzini. The difference between wine and grape juice is a small thing in pure American history, but to the Italian American it had some very serious consequences. Joe Liotto, mayor of San Francisco, touched on this difference lightly in a speech he made in the North Beach section of his city. For one thing, I've told some of you this before, when we had that, when we had that horrible iron curtain put over us between 1918 and 1933 in that thing they called the National Prohibition, only North Beach kept the faith. <laughs> only North Beach kept the faith. And it was, you know, and it was, you know, but they did it legally. They did it legally, that they did legally. You remember, all of us remember the wine that used to be crushed in North Beach. They used to bring the grapes around and they crush the wine and do all of that. But everything was done quite legally, you see, because that statute, the prohibition statute had in it that you could make wine either for sacramental religious purposes or you could make it for health purposes. And you have no idea 
how many sick and religious Italians we had in North Beach at that time. You had no idea. Anyway. While government officials were busy breaking bottles of illegal whiskey, organized crime began to finance itself with bootlegging. In the 20s and 30s, the leading criminals had Jewish, Irish, and Anglo-Saxon names like Lansky, Moran, Dillinger. Italian organizations like Al Capone's were the exception. The mafia of the immigrants did not become powerful until prohibition. We'll talk about that in a moment. The great national thirst began. This government worker takes a swig of the contraband he's destroying. To all Latins, prohibition was a Protestant, Anglo-Saxon madness. To all sensible Latins, wine is a food. Each of these boccia players probably knew someone who made wine in his cellar. Now, after you press the grapes, what's left is skin and stems and pits. And what you do with what's left over is distill it and you make grappa, Italian moonshine. To make grappa, you need a still. There were stills in every house in Little Italy. And as I've said, wine's a food. Americans drink pop, Italians drink wine. Nobody gets drunk except on predetermined dates. So here they were, these old men with a still in the cellar, and the people outside Little Italy willing to pay dollars for what cost only a few cents. All it took was organization. And the little organization called the Mafia was in big business in America. This film was made in the 1950s for Italian television. The Italian communities of America were as exotic to Italian Italians as they were to American Americans. A faded fossil of a subculture had been preserved. The most idealized member of the Italian peasant family is the mother. She's expected to be pure, fertile, and pay no attention to whatever her husband or son's business may be. In affluent America, Mama rides in a white Cadillac. This is proper dancing. The women are alone. A man alone. Warm, friendly, family-oriented little Italy, where everything you see lies sanely and happily right on the surface. Like a Pirandello play, where one man's sanity is another man's madness, here's another film. It was made by people engaged in stakeouts. It's a hidden view of Mulberry Street. Here on the corner of Mulberry and Spring, watching the weather, is the former bodyguard of Lucky Luciano. Lorenzo Chappie Brescia has served time for extortion. Law enforcement people are forever taking pictures in this neighborhood, sometimes with cause. And sometimes the residents wish they'd go further downtown and take mugshots of Wall Street stock swindlers. Two forty nine Mulberry Street. Standing in the doorway, wiping his face, is Louis Palmieri, who has a record for desertion and gambling. That's the doorway to the Ravenite Club whose activities are a constant source of interest to detectives. The enforcement people who made this film found themselves photographing a New York City plainclothesman. He sees the lens and stays undercover. Now watch. He waits for somebody to come by and uses him to cross to a place where he knows there's not enough light for the camera. Meanwhile, here's Leonard Scotty Mercurio, a dandy and a gambler who's paid his debt to society six times.
The point of all this is that Little Italy has many virtues, and for the organized criminal, it has the value of being a kind of DMZ. It's simply understood that no one commits crimes of substance in this museum of a neighborhood. As a matter of fact, Little Italy usually has the lowest crime rate of any section of a city. There are too many enforcers around, including the police. The most important mafioso we could find is Carlo Gambino. He's the godfather of all New York families. But it's his smile that we call attention to. It's the look of a man who clearly knows the difference between the secret codes of Sicilian justice and the written codes of American law. He must occasionally tolerate the intrusions of the American legal system in the defense of his old world honor. Gambino is so important that he only has a minor criminal record and a history of heart attacks just before he's supposed to be deported. This perverted honor roll has to include a man who parlayed his post-war job as a translator for the American army into the head of the whole black market for southern Italy. Vito Genovese has that same certain smile. Is it true that you're the head of the uh, mafia in this country? It is not. It's true. Well, sir, have you ever been connected with the mafia at any time? Never. What about uh, the government's charge that you're the right man, that you're the number one man in this narcotics uh, business? The charges are fantastic and ridiculous. You think what, and, and, that's and, what they are. And have you ever uh, known anyone in the narcotics racket? Have you no, known I anyone? never did. Have you ever known anyone in the underworld? The whole thing is ridiculous. What is good Vito good? Genovese's record included murder, auto homicide, and he'll die in prison after he's found guilty on this narcotics charge. He's a respectable businessman, and these charges are ridiculous and fantastic, and he wants to be left alone to continue to conduct his business in his ordinary manner. Joe Bonanno has that small smile, too. He tried to become a respectable businessman. In a dark and intricate feud with the Gambino, Lucchese, and Magadino families, he asserted his independence. He's the father in Gay Talese's book, Honor Thy Father. He represents that step we've been talking about, from a peasant father to the middle class by way of crime. But Joe Bonanno kept the peasant rules of secrecy and quiet. This maverick mafioso never said anything in public. In 1967, the New York police arrested a number of men at La Stella restaurant in Queens. One of the men who hid his face from the camera was Joe Colombo, who wanted no publicity at all. Three years later, in 1970, Joe came out from the quiet. There was little doubt that the FBI and the press had been harassing Italians, and Joe wanted his say. I have always maintained and said there is no mafia, there is no Cosa Nostra. And I said that this was only a harassment of the Justice Department, of the administration, and the law enforcement agencies for no other reason than to hurt people, to hurt children, and to brainwash and use the Italian people as the scapegoat for each and every crime that's committed in this country. Joe Colombo went 20th century and public. He organized the Italian-American Civil Rights League and moved into ethnic politics. Joe Colombo, the mafia leader who had specialized in gambling, now moved from anonymity to advertising. There was a moment of pure peasant supplication in this office. Though it's Madison Avenue in the 1970s, this deference is Palermo in the 1800s that noble smile and that courtly bow to a man of respect. Joe got his first rally in 1970, the largest gathering in the history of Italian-Americans. And despite who he was, he had emerged as the most powerful Italian-American leader in the East. I thank God that I was born of Italian birth. <laughs> This day belongs to you, the people. You are organized. You are one. Nobody could take you apart anymore. In mafia circles, there was consternation. The hidden code had been broken. The secret society had been Americanized. The question was, what kind of power was Colombo trying to build for himself? The site itself was unthinkable to Colombo's peers a mafia leader standing before 50,000 people in Columbus Circle, guarded by the police. So a year later, the mob shot Joe Colombo. 
This day belongs to you, the people. You are organized. You are one. Nobody could take you apart anymore. All this blood is a sign of the declining strength of the Mafia. Because when the secret organization is really working, in full control, it's fear, not blood, that keeps people in line. When people are scared, you don't have to use muscle. It's only when the organization is in trouble that blood gets spilled. There are a lot of internal stresses among the Cugini today. The young ones have given up on the idea of a godfatherly organization with its traditional rackets. The new mafiosi are playing for phony stock deals and heroin wholesaling. They prefer nightclubs to espresso cafes. They live in suburban houses and hold country club memberships. The old ones know that the organization can't stay alive unless it stays disciplined and secret. The Americanization of the Mafia is a contradiction in terms. The Godfathers would say that public criminality should belong to the politicians, not to the racketeers. And that's why Joe Colombo was shot. He tried to throw a bridge over a cultural chasm too wide to span. And that's why inevitably, given time, the Mafia has to go. You can't play a Sicilian game by American rules. I've never been happier. The kids are doing well. We have a beautiful grandchild. Charlie and I spend more time together than ever, and he still treats me in that very special way. It really pays to take care of yourself. I exercise, eat right, and be sure I get enough iron and vitamins, I take Geritol every morning. Charlie does too. Geritol, more than twice the iron of ordinary supplements, plus seven vitamins. Take care of yourself. Take Geritol. Honey, you're incredible. Daddy, can I have a dog? No, Eleanor, you can't have a dog. You had a dog when you were little. Well, things were different then. Aren't things different now? No, they're the same. Then can I have a dog? No, Eleanor, you can't have a dog. Daddy, I already have a dog. You already have a dog? You can't. No dog. Dog? I had a nice big dog once. Lots of pampers dog. pickles to pamper people. For whatever pampering needs to be done. Hey, Dad, can I have a horse? <laughs> Give me another Vlasic pickle. Then what you say? No headache is going to make me snap at my child. When headache pain and the tension it can build bring out the worst in you, take Anison. Why Anison? Watch. Anison starts with as much pain reliever as the leading aspirin tablet, then adds an extra core of this specific fast-acting ingredient against pain. Anison helps the best of you come through. Feeling better? Anison did it again. Anison relieves headache pain, and so it's tension. Anison. Hope you feel better, Mom. When a cold invades your sinuses and just bending over makes your head pound, let Dristan tablets help. Dristan works directly on the critical sinus areas where colds infection can breed when they fill with congestion. Dristan opens sinuses, works quickly to help drain congestion, fight sinus cold miseries. Good, Mom. Good enough to race you home. Dristan tablets, the sinus drainer for colds and congestion. This is that same rally of the Italian American Civil Rights League in 1970. The leading organizers of this group are currently under indictment for lying on their applications for personal loans. They claim they've been smeared on the most minor of infractions, but that's not our story. The rally is just broken up and a number of intercultural events are about to take place. The League's making a passeggiata, a little walk to the FBI's New York headquarters. What they want to do is picket the FBI because the agency really has a nasty habit of over-investigating anybody with an Italian name. The line of march got confused. The New York police courteously led the parade to 69th and 3rd. There, another contingent resolutely took up the defense of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. But this isn't the Italian way to do things. This is imitation militant. Instead of songs of protest, they came down 3rd Avenue singing Arrivederci Roma. Responding to its own cultural patterns, the FBI put the whole group under surveillance. Now during this month, according to a federal grand jury, about $720,000 in negotiable securities was being stolen from the Bankers Trust Company. And here's the late fat Jerry Ciprio, who we saw earlier. 
He's one of the thieves who could have been picked up this day for his part in the robbery. Joe and Anthony Colombo were Caesars for a day on a sound truck. But you know, it worked. Shortly after this day, the FBI stopped using the words Mafia and Cosa Nostra in its press releases, even if the agency didn't change its suspicions. And it should have worked, because the honest 99-plus percent of the Italian-American community was being harassed by too many law enforcement agencies just because they were of Italian descent. As a personal experience, if you want to call it small potatoes, you may. I was asked to run for a certain office. The first question the congressman asked the group, check Macalino out for mafia connections. Now, to me, that is not small potatoes. This is a direct stigma. My name ends in a vowel. Let's make certain he's not a member of the mafia. What is this, that every, every Italian is, is uh, connected with the mafia? I don't, I don't even know one mafia person. There is nobody in my family who is related to the mafia. Why do I have to have this stigma attached to me that I, I am either part of the mafia or connected with the mafia or backed with the, by the mafia? Now, who is it that you have, you can look up to in the Italian community? Who is, who's there that you can look up to for leadership? We have nobody. We really don't. We have nobody to say, I want to be like him, or we have nobody to say, I love the way he represents me. There is nobody there. I, I, had, I don't think there is anyone, that, any Italian-American that exists right now that I could really look up to and relate to. And that's the whole problem. There is no one I can relate to. There's only the image of, of spaghetti and meatballs or the mafia, and that's no image at all. There are more than spaghetti and meatballs around this San Francisco table. Claire Janini Hoffman, whose father founded the Bank of America, the largest bank in the world, $30 billion in assets. Emilio Segre, a Nobel Prize winner, who helped Enrico Fermi develop the atomic bomb. Robert Di Giorgio, who runs a $360 million a year corporation. Joseph Aliotto, mayor of San Francisco, the self-made millionaire son of a Sicilian immigrant. As a Latin, the mayor had something pertinent to say about Anglo-Saxons. There always exists in the Anglo-Saxon mind some necessity to attribute whatever, whatever woes the world may have to some unseen conspiratorial force. One time it was the Vatican that was engaged in international conspiracy, another time the Jews, another time the Jesuits, and now it happens to be a group of uh, Sicilians who for the most part are... Uh, while very real, there are some very real Sicilian gangsters, make no mistake about that, as there are very real Irish gangsters and Jewish gangsters and, and gangsters in the economic order who steal a lot more than gangsters in the order of wine or whiskey or gambling, who steal a lot more. But there isn't any doubt, uh, Luigi, there is this notion about international conspiracies that fired the imaginations of too many Anglo-Saxons. This reverse conspiracy hit Joe Aliotto in the middle of his political career when we picked him up in the 1971 mayoral campaign, he was breathing hard in Italian. And not overlooking any votes, including the Chinese. The real place you have a Chinese button. See that? Chinese. Nice to see you, dear. Joe Eliotto is the most popular Italian on the West Coast. But there were two unresolved lawsuits at this time. One had been brought by the Justice Department just about the time the mayor was ready to run for governor of California. Another he had brought against Look Magazine. See, I certainly do. How have you been? You're the only hope little guy's got against these character assassins. Well, thank you very much. We'll see you Joe Ali Otto is the only mayor in America who can kiss a hand without embarrassment. Nice to see you, Dick. It's a real pleasure. Thank you. In 1969, Look Magazine tried to tie him to the mafia. Nice to see you. Look leaped before it checked. It was a cheap shot that wounded the mayor for eight months. But because he's a millionaire lawyer who could fight back, Aliotto took the magazine to court. The trial exonerated him of all ties to the mafia. The citizens of San Francisco returned Joe Aliotto to City Hall by an even wider majority than he had received in his first election. First of all, Look Magazine is nice, is now broke, as you know, and uh, Nick, couldn't happen to a nicer magazine. <laughs> in any event, look, in 1969, people were saying that I might be running for governor of California. 
Now, at the same time, you know, my office was still doing the principal antitrust work on, against the cartels, against big business in the country. The year before I ran for mayor, we had more lawsuits in my office against cartels than the Department of Justice had just the year before I ran for mayor. Uh, so this combination of things uh, got a lot of people to thinking that maybe they had to clip my wings. And so what do you do when you have a fellow with an Italian name? And if his father came from Sicily, the first thing you do is to suggest he's a member of the mafia or has some kind of mafia suggestions. And this is what Look Magazine did. Now, if you read the article closely, you know, the, 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 the evidence was very, very thin, but nobody reads those articles. They just see pictures and diagrams of the mayor of San Francisco and meshed in a web of mafia affiliations or some silly thing like that. Now, it didn't matter, you know, that San Francisco was the cleanest city in the country so far as mafia affiliations were concerned, and everybody said that from J. Edgar Hoover down to the U.S. Attorney, the Chief of Police, the Attorney General of the State of California, the President's Crime Commission. Everybody said that, but it didn't matter. Here was a fellow with an Italian name, with a Sicilian ancestry, and so they published this article. It worked. It kept me out of that governor's race in 1970, and there are political analysts whom I respect who have looked back and said that but for that look magazine article that I would have been the candidate and would have won in 1970. Now, I don't know, you know, all the words of tongue or pen, the saddest are or might have been or whatever that line goes, but I don't care about that. I really don't. I am willing to pay that price. I'd rather be an Italian and pay that price, an Italian-American and pay that price, than not be an Italian-American and not have to pay that price. But it's also a necessary, Nick, to beat that kind of stuff. Joel Yoto comes from San Francisco, where the Mafia once tried to become serious, but it couldn't get a foothold. But you know, the same thing is true in Sicily. The Mafia exists in western Sicily, but not in the eastern part of the island. And the reason is that certain conditions have to be present before the Mafia can make a move. If the people refuse to accept their services, the so-called honorable society goes out of business. If the people won't get scared, and if local government is strong and fair, there is no mafia. When you think about it, organized crime is a service organization. It needs loyal and satisfied customers. There's no use blaming Italians when so many Americans are buying what the mafia sells. In an eat thy neighbor business society, which wants shady loans or officials who look the other way, there's a demand the organization can fill. There's no reason for Italians to take the rap for what Americans want. I wish your countrymen would pay more attention to the Italian virtues. It wasn't long ago that the Italians helped build America with their backs. Not only the physical labor was Italian, but the noblest buildings of today and yesterday are derived from Italian architecture. More important, we've reminded you of the pleasure of simple things. A glass of wine, dining, not feeding, and the pride of craftsmanship. But above all, in America, where family life seems to be falling apart, the Italians may have a lesson to teach. It's the family that the Italian always turns to when times get difficult. Not the perverted family of the Mafia, but the basic vessel of the human voyage. We Italians have always been apprehensive about the direction of our government. And now, for the first time, Americans are showing the same nervousness about their state. So you've got something to learn from us. In Italy, we know that when the regime isn't working, the family has to work. Curiously and paradoxically, this essay on the mafia ends with the Italianization of the United States, the red, white, and greening of America, as you once called it, Nick. Buonasera, Nick. Ciao, Luigi. When you're a swimming coach, you get to know a lot about athletes' foot. My best swimmers got it. I always recommend Absorbing Junior. Absorbing Junior, with its control flow applicator, gets right to the itch in seconds. Helps cure athletes' foot because it kills fungus on contact. Hey, coach. Yeah? I can feel it working. Great. Absorbing Junior really works. Kills fungus on contact. Stops itch in seconds. Try it. I'd like to introduce you to Glade's new air freshener, Sunny Lemon. Newest of the natural scents from Glade. 
Sunny Lemon gives your home a scent like fresh lemons have on a sunny day. A scent clean and alive, the way lemons smell inside. Now your home can smell lemon fresh, naturally clean. Sunny Lemon inside is like a sunny day outside. Sunny Lemon, newest of the natural scents from Glade.